Hi everybody and welcome to the latest episode of Now and Men, the podcast about men, masculinities and gender equality. It's Stephen Burrell here with Sandy Rutchison as always. Hi Sandy. Hi Stephen. So today for our 31st episode we have one of the leading voices internationally in the field of men and boys involvement in preventing violence against women and building gender equality. It's Michael Flood who's a professor in the School of Justice at Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane, Australia. Yes and Michael has been involved in pro-feminist activism uh, since he was the age of 20 having first got involved in an anti-sexist men's group in Australia in 1987. And since then, he's written numerous uh, highly influential academic publications on issues including violence against women and violence prevention, men and masculinities, pro-feminist men's advocacy, male heterosexuality, fathering and pornography. He's also written a book which is something of a Bible for this field called Engaging Men and Boys in Violence Prevention, which was published in 2019. And his work has been highly influ- influential beyond as well as within academia, both in Australia and internationally. Uh, he also runs the hugely popular website XY Online, which is a treasure trove of resources on men, masculinities and uh, gender politics. And I can re- recommend his Twitter feed too. It's a great source of up-to-date information, advocacy and evidence. Yeah, so thank you so much for coming on the show, Michael. It's uh, really great to have you with us. Thank you. That's a very, a very generous um, introduction. And look, it's funny when when I um, have such biographies read out for me at a you know at a kind of a presentation, I often sort of hasten to add that this doesn't mean I've got it all worked out. It doesn't mean I know everything or I'm some kind of perfect person. You know, there's all kinds of ways in which I stuff up and all kinds of ways in which I have much to learn. So yes, I have been doing this work for some time, um, but in no way does that position me as some kind of I don't. Know, perfect exemplar of this field or something. I'm not sure. Thank you. And perhaps we can get into some of those things more as the conversation progresses. But yeah, perhaps to start off with, um, I guess it's fair to say that I suppose the field of work with men and boys um, has grown quite substantially in recent decades, uh, both in Australia and internationally, Um, especially, I suppose, in relation to the prevention of, of men's violence against women, but also surrounding issues like fatherhood, health and well-being, especially sexual and reproductive health. And of course, you yourself have been an important kind of driver of this work. Um, So yeah, why do you think it is that it has been expanding in these ways in recent decades? And I suppose presumably you would see that as being a good thing. And and if so, uh, why why is that a good thing? Uh, Look, great question. I think there's a few things driving that expansion of work that is self-consciously focused on engaging men and boys. And, And one thing to say here is, you know, work with men and boys is hardly historically new. I mean, for a long time, governments and community organisations worked with husbands, worked with fathers, worked with citizens and so on. But what's new about the engaging men field is its self-conscious focus on men as men and its self-conscious and explicit attention to gender and masculinity. And yes, certainly that's intensified in the last uh, two or three decades in you know many Western countries and, in fact, throughout the world. And so we see an increase in projects and initiatives, as you've said, and a proliferation of projects and organisations with a focus on engaging men and boys, an international field, and as you've said, a growing body of scholarship. So I think a few things are driving it. One One is feminism and the kind of women's rights and feminist attention to gender has prompted an attention as part of that to the ways in which men's lives are gendered. And while the term gender often has been used as code for women, gender issues. Sometimes they've been understood as issues that are of particular concern to women or that involve women. Of course, men and men's lives are just as gendered. Our lives are shaped just as much by the norms, the expectations, the inequalities associated with gender as women's are. So I think one thing driving attention to men and boys has been that, that kind of recognition uh, driven by feminism of the need to pay attention to men and masculinity. And certainly feminism for a long time has debated and discussed um, how boys are socialized, how men are raised, and how those things then play out in the, the mistreatment that some men perpetrate against women. A second thing I think that's driven this is a kind of growing attention in health and violence prevention fields to, uh, to, to sort of men, to men as a kind of social problem. So if you think, for example, of public violence, public order violence, of, you know, assaults in the streets, uh, 
um, increasingly there's a recognition that those assaults are largely by men against other men and that they are driven in part by dynamics of masculinity. And we're seeing that same insight applied to drug abuse, to risky driving, to workplace uh, injuries and deaths, to men's involvement in parenting and so on. So I think that another thing driving the engaging men field has been the growing recognition that again, the kind of norms, practices and structures associated with masculinity shape those social problems. Yeah, that's, that's kind of off the top of my head. I think um, you know, there's some of the things that are driving this growing engaging men field. Is it a good thing? Undoubtedly. I think uh, we should celebrate the fact that, for example, in the field of violence prevention, there's growing attention to how to shift attitudes and behaviours and social structural relations among men as part of prevention. And in fact, in particular fields, I think there are further factors that have shaped this growing attention to men and boys. In the violence prevention field, for example, uh, in the last few decades, there's been an increasing emphasis on primary prevention, on the need to prevent initial perpetration and initial victimization. So not only do we need to work with victim survivors, not only do we need to hold perpetrators accountable, but we need to change the social conditions that make domestic and sexual violence take place in the first place. And part of that, I think, coming along with that shift towards primary prevention has been a growing emphasis on the need to engage men and boys in prevention. I suppose there's also, um, following on from that, I guess, a kind of ever-growing body of, of research evidence on this work, right? some of which you yourself have conducted, of course. Then. And, um, yeah, could you perhaps... Obviously, this is quite a large topic to discuss in, its, in and of itself, but could you perhaps briefly lay out, you know, what you think are some of the central lessons from this research, I suppose, about how can we effectively, you know, and meaningfully engage with men and boys, perhaps especially when it comes to, like, the prevention of violence against women, which is an area that you focus in particular on. Like, so, you know, what kind of tips would you give to an organisation who was starting to, you know, look to develop work of this kind uh, for the first time? Great question. Look, I, I think there's two broad answers. One is that any violence prevention work, whether it's aimed at men or women or you know, trans people or other, other communities, should embody what we know to be principles of effective practice in general. So, um, you know, work with men and boys, like work with any other community, first of all, should be informed. That is, it should incorporate both an appropriate theoretical framework and a theory of change. It should have a sound understanding of the problem, of what domestic and sexual violence and other forms of interpersonal violence look like and what drives them. What are the risk factors or predictors or determinants or drivers of those forms of violence? And overlapping with that, how can they be changed? You know, how can we effectively shift those drivers or risk factors? Second, any violence prevention work needs to be comprehensive. It needs to use multiple strategies in multiple settings at multiple levels. So one-off talks, small duration, small-scale interventions are unlikely to make the change that's necessary. Third, any violence prevention effort needs to be engaging. If it involves um, work with people, as most violence prevention interventions do, it needs to engage participants. So that means using effective strategies, whether it's face-to-face -face education or communications and social marketing, or community mobilisation and so on. And the fourth general principle is that this work must be relevant. It must be relevant to the communities and contexts in which it's delivered. So I think that violence prevention work with men and boys needs to live up to those four criteria. That means, for example, if you're doing face-to-face -face work with boys, and much of, much of the violence prevention work that happens with boys and men involves face-to-face -face education programs, then it needs to live up to what we know to be um, criteria for effective practice in face-to-face -face education, things like whole of institution approach, things like engaging and interactive forms of teaching and learning, um, things like relevant and tailored practice and so on. But there then are um, further, I think, lessons from, you know, three or four decades of experience in work with men and boys and scholarship in work with men and boys about what's most likely to engage men and boys in change. And we have to remember here that men and boys typically start off in a worse place than women and girls. Men and boys typically have poorer understandings of domestic and sexual violence. They are more likely to define those behaviours narrowly. They're more likely to blame the victim, more likely to excuse the perpetrator and so on. And so in a sense, we've got a harder job 
when it comes to engaging men and boys. And many men and boys already feel defensive, feel blamed, and are more likely to respond with resistance and backlash to violence prevention efforts. So we have to work harder with men and boys than we may have to with women and girls in doing this work. And so one key lesson I think that's come from the last few decades is we have to emphasize the positive. We need positive and strengths-based approaches that start by start with messages that in most contexts at least, most men and boys don't use violence against women and girls. Most men and boys treat the women and girls in their lives with respect and care. We need to appeal to men as bystanders, as bystanders to other men's violence and other men's violence supportive behaviours, whether that's rape jokes or sexist comments and so on. But although I've said that our work with men and boys has to start with positive or strengths-based approaches, that doesn't involve a kind of naive, romanticised um, appeal to men and boys, because we have to also recognise that there will be men and boys in the room who use violence or who condone violence. So we have to balance that strengths-based approach with a, a kind of critical invitation to men to look at our own behaviour, to look at our own treatment of women and girls, and to strive for non-violence and respect in our own behaviour. So there are lessons around positive and strengths-based approaches. There are lessons around uh, diversity. For example, there's growing acknowledgement that men and boys, like women and girls, are not all the same. We need an intersectional analysis that recognises that men's and boys' lives, just like those of women and girls, are structured not only by gender, but by ethnicity, by class, by sexuality, and so on. And so our, we need to have a diversity of approaches that are more likely to reach men from ethnic minorities, men from working class backgrounds, uh, men who are trans, who are gay, bisexual, and so on. That's a great summary of the uh, evidence. Thanks, Michael. Um, but you, you mentioned um, at the start that you were very positive about the growth of this work. Um, I'm encountering that. I wonder if you could say something about any concerns you might have about that move as well. I, I mean, are there trends in violence prevention work in Australia or internationally which you think are, are problematic? Um, and are there any issues that you know face this work which you find particularly worrying? Look, absolutely. And look, I think there's, a, there's an analogy that is very useful here. We could be, we could be talking about anti-racism, about the need to challenge you know, white supremacy and uh, racist or white supremacist ideologies and groups and inequalities. And in, if we were doing that, we would be focused in this conversation on the role that white people can play in challenging racism. Because when we try to mobilise men, when we try to engage men in challenging patriarchal gender inequalities, we are engaging members of a privileged group in challenging the bases of that privilege. Now, of course, when I say privileged group, I don't mean that all men are privileged and all women are disadvantaged because a you know, feminist intersectionality 101 tells us that's not true and that class and ethnicity and so on also structure women's and men's and other people's lives. But as a group, men are advantaged relative to women. And so this is a delicate politics. Engaging men involves a delicate politics. And there are some risks here. There are some risks here of attention to men and boys pushing aside the hard won and still vital work um, focused on women and girls. And so, for example, you know, one of my concerns about the engaging men field and about work with men and boys in violence prevention, at least, is it may have diminished the legitimacy of women only and women focused programs and groups. And certainly anecdotally, some women's groups and networks report that they now feel under pressure to include men, to kind of open up specific groups or specific programs to men. And I, I'm all for working with men. I've been a cheerleader for working with men for a long time, as you know. But I still think that we have to protect and respect uh, women only and women focused programs and services as well. So that's one issue is diminishing legitimacy of women focused mm -hmm. efforts. A second concern is invalidating and marginalising women's voices and women's expertise. Now, I don't think this has happened very often, but I think there is a risk that increasingly um, so women's voices are marginalised and there's a sense, oh, we have to hear from the men. And, uh, you know, that can kind of push aside, I think, the leadership of women in putting issues of domestic 
and sexual violence on the agenda. These are risks. I don't think these are risks that have really been realised. If we look at the engaging men field in Australia and internationally, in general, there is a strong emphasis on the need for accountability. That is the need for respectful and collaborative and gender equitable relations with women and women's rights groups. There's a respect for women's movement leadership and acknowledgement of the work that's been done. But there is nevertheless a risk here. And a third issue, I would say, is kind of, you know, we live in a patriarchal society or well, countries across the world are patriarchal countries. And patriarchal dynamics uh, also can shape the efforts of men to challenge patriarchy. So, for example, there are sometimes dynamics where men who do the work are put on a pedestal, put on a pedestal and given praise and attention out of proportion to our efforts and out of proportion to the praise and attention given to women's efforts. And again, dynamics of tokenism, of collusion and so on. So part of the work, part of the work of engaging men and of men taking up issues of gender inequality, of violence against women, is being attentive to the kind of gender dynamics which can structure that work. I think you've, you've uh, also said, um, you know, there is an issue of whether men may take over what has been seen as, as women's roles, women's work. Um, but actually the problem, in your view, is more that men don't turn up to, to do this work at all. Yeah, that's um, right. That, I think that's more often the problem, at least. Um, yeah, look, one, one of the problems of the engaging men field, I think, is that often the work is done by women. So in Australia, for example, um, the, the White Ribbon Campaign, the international campaign um, for men to show their commitment to ending violence against women, that exists in Australia. And in fact, the Australian White Ribbon Campaign is one of the largest campaigns in the world. And in 2016, for example, there were something like 800 events around the country in the name of the White Ribbon Campaign, you know, a very significant kind of community mobilisation. But two thirds of those events were organised by women, not men. And there's a problem here of men not turning up. Now, it's understandable that men you know, don't necessarily recognise this issue as personally relevant to them, whereas women are much more likely to go, oh, yes, you know, I will turn up, I'll support this effort. But that's a problem. And certainly with the White Ribbon Campaign, other efforts to engage men and boys in violence prevention should be working their hardest to make sure that they're engaging men in particular and that men are doing the work that there's not a dynamic where it's women who organise the event, women who make the cakes and book the, you know, book the microphone and so on, and then it's men in front of the microphone getting the status and attention on the day of the event. Yeah, I, I guess um, at the heart of that, there's, there's the tension, isn't there, in uh, involving men in working to, uh, to some extent, dismantle their own power and privilege, isn't there? So, you know... That's and, right, and, and this is the politics also... of... Sorry, after you. Well, I was just going to say there are, there are lots of opportunities for things to go wrong and for mistakes to be made. And I wondered if you could say a little bit about some of the problems and, you know, what are some of the key missteps men and organisations working with men uh, should seek to avoid, in your view? Yeah, sure. Look, I think a, a key concept here, well, two key concepts. One is allyship, that really what we're talking about is the practice of allyship. And there's a well-developed, I think, body of experience and increasingly of scholarship of what that looks like, particularly, for example, for white people uh, seeking to be anti-racist allies and to some extent for heterosexual people seeking to be allies to LGBTQ plus people as well. So in the field of gender issues, we can draw lessons from that. And uh, the key, I think, the key principle here is that allies should be accountable, should be accountable to members of the relevant disadvantaged group. And the reason that that's important is because members of the disadvantaged group, in this case women, ha typically have a better understanding of the sy systems of oppression we're trying to address. And um, in relation to gender politics, men are socialised away from accountability. We're socialised towards an alignment with other men, towards a bonding with other men and towards looking towards other men for status and approval and so on. And without women's voices, without women's leadership, even well-intentioned men and men's groups can reinforce sexism and can do harm. So for me, accountability simply means working in gender equitable ways, working in a gender equitable way. And we can see that at three levels. And so when it goes wrong, at the personal level, male advocates use violence and abuse ourselves, or we collude with violence and um, abuse. At the relational level, the level of interactions, when there's no accountability, then what it looks like is men dominating. Men dominating in meetings and networks where there are women, men's voices being given priority over women, um, 
women supporting and nurturing men, providing emotional labor, and men not doing that for women. Then at the institutional level, at the level of relations between groups, where there's no accountability, then men's groups take action which is harmful for women, they take funding and resources away from women and women's groups, or even, even worst of all, men's groups use strategies that make gender inequalities and make violence worse. Now, some of those things have happened some of the time. I think in general, the engaging men field has taken seriously the need for accountability, although, you know, there have been some of these problems in, you know, in certain contexts. So what accountability looks like then is at the personal level, looking at our own behaviour and seeking to, you know, behave non-violently. That's the bottom line, to behave non-violently and gender equitably. Um, at the relational level, it means striving for gender equitable dynamics, gender equitable processes and interaction. So I'm thinking here of whose voices get heard, who decides and who leads, who does the low, low status work, whose efforts are given attention and so on. Then at the institutional level, so we've got personal, we've got relational, and then institutional. At the institutional level, what I'm thinking of is structures of consultation and collaboration. So if you're involved in a men's group or network, it means talking to women and women's rights organisations before seeking funding. So you're not taking funding away from or competing for funding um, with women's groups and networks. One, one thing I was wondering, Michael, um, based on what you were saying there, when you were talking earlier about you know men sometimes being put on a pedestal, you know, for because not that many men do speak about these issues, and um, so it can, as much as anything, be quite rare when, when a man does that, and that can be lauded and so on and so forth. And I feel like I've been aware of that, you know, in my own when I've been speaking and, and, and things sometimes when doing this work. And um, I suppose, yeah, I mean, do you have any advice or like strategies in terms of like? You know, what, what do you do with that, like, as a man? Like, if you're aware that you're getting a lot of, a lot of you know, perhaps undeserved praise, <laughs> or, or yes. you know, where you just feel like, actually, this should be shared out, you know, more more equally, more with women. Like, you know, do you have any approaches to, to dealing with that? And it's difficult, isn't it? Because like, I suppose we should be encouraging and celebrating men speaking out, because obviously that is something we want more men to do. But, yeah, like, do you have any uh, ways of, of dealing with that kind of... Um, yeah, <laughs> I, I do. And look, my own experience in, in doing this work over a long time is, is getting two kinds, two very different kinds of reactions. On the one hand, the kind of excessive praise. You know, it's so wonderful that you're doing this. I wish there were more men like you, that kind of thing. And on the other, a kind of suspicion or distrust. Mm -hmm. You know, who the hell are you? Why should we trust you? And so on. And both responses from women are very understandable and, you know, shouldn't themselves be criticised. But I think there are ways to respond particularly to the first one, um, that, that kind of pedestal effect we've described. And so I think humility is important. I think acknowledging uh, our own flawed nature, our own, you know, the fact that we're merely human. I think um, disavowing any kind of, you know, um, disavowing any sense that we're perfect or those kinds of things. Uh, acknowledging women's leadership is important. Acknowledging women's voices. Uh, handing the microphone to women and using the praise or attention we're given to amplify women's voices. I suppose they're some of the strategies uh, I've used um, to try to diminish that kind of pedestal effect. Yeah, um, just moving focus a little bit. Um, you wrote a great paper in 2015 where you provided a kind of a critical stock take of the field of engaging men. And um, an issue which has come up a few times on our podcast, and actually you and I were speaking at a, about it earlier at a White Ribbon Australia event, um, is like how best to address, I suppose, issues of masculinity or the kind of concept of masculinity. Um, because I suppose that the term toxic masculinity has become quite popular in public discourse in recent years. Um, but equally, we also see lots of organisations now who are working with men and boys using ideas such as that of healthy masculinity or positive masculinity. Um, so, yeah, I mean, what do you think about these concepts? Like, do you think they're useful or is there a risk of reinforcing men's investments in masculinity when actually that's something which we should probably be seeking to like unpick or maybe even try to move away from altogether? Like, yeah, what do you think <laughs> about what's the best, best approach there? <laughs> Look, it's a very live issue. And, and I think we can... It, in some ways, let's talk first about the problem and then let's talk about the solution. So if we think about the problem, yeah, the phrase toxic masculinity is ubiquitous now and that is very new. It really only came into widespread public circulation in about 2015. And the term itself, I, this will be surprising for some listeners, the term doesn't originate in feminist discussions of men and men's behaviour. It originates instead in attention to men's health and attention to the limits 
placed on men themselves by narrow or stereotypical norms of masculinity. And it really had a currency in kind of men's health and men's movement circles for some time in the 90s before it uh, has you know, taken off in popular discussion um, in the 2010s. And I have mixed feelings about the term. Um, so, you know, I mean, s simplistically, the term refers to one particular version of how to be a man, one particular set of expectations about manhood that is toxic, that is, is bad for men themselves because it limits men's own health, men's relations with women, with children and so on, and bad for women because it shapes men's involvement in sexism, in violence, in other forms of abusive and harmful behaviour towards women, towards men and so on. So a synonym for the synonyms for the term toxic masculinity would be terms like sexist or patriarchal or dominant masculinity or in scholarship, hegemonic masculinity. In, you know, the set of expectations that men must be dominant, men must, men must be aggressive, in control, tough, daring, stoic, and so on. But one problem that we regularly encounter with the term is that many men don't understand the term in, those, in that sense at all. Many men understand the term toxic masculinity as synonymous with men, that any criticism of masculinity is a criticism of men per se, of men in general. So they kind of miss the key point about the phrase that it's referring to one particular version of masculinity. It's like the phrase toxic food. It's not saying there's something wrong with food in general. It's saying there's a problem with this particular form of food, which is toxic. So I, I think the phrase is useful in part because it emphasises that the problem is a social problem. The problem is one of how boys and men are socialised. It highlights that one version of how to be a man is unhealthy or dangerous, and there may be other versions of how to be a man that are positive and useful. And, and it rests on a, an insight which has considerable scholarly support, an insight that stereotypical or traditional masculine norms shape men's behaviour, shape men's involvement in violence, in fathering, in health, and so on. But the term also has some risks, as I've said, a risk of kind of misperception where men in general feel blamed and attacked. It also may imply that the only problem with dominant versions of masculinity is the harms they impose among men themselves, that, you know, that the costs they, they involve in terms of male disadvantage and not also in terms of male privilege. Also, I've seen the term used in kind of generalising and homogenising ways. But let's get to the solution. Another risk of the term toxic masculinity is it may imply that the solution therefore is healthy or positive masculinity. And if we look at the engaging men field in general and the preventing violence against women field in particular, across those we see an increasing use of the phrases healthy masculinity or positive masculinity. And I have mixed feelings about that phrase. On the one hand, I see strategic value or pragmatic value in offering to men and boys a version of how to be a man that is based on positive or healthy qualities. Where we frame manhood, we try to redefine manhood as based in gender equality, in nonviolence, in respect, in nurturance, in compassion, and so on. In other words, we identify the desirable qualities we, sh we wish to see among men and boys, and we phrase those as healthy or positive masculinities, and we appeal to men in terms of those. But there's a number of obvious problems here. One is, as you've said, Stephen, that we are sustaining, if not intensifying, men's investments in being seen as properly masculine. And part of the problems of men's violence against women, part of the problem of domestic and sexual violence, is men's investments in being seen as real men, men's investments in being properly perceived as masculine. And part of our goal, I think, should actually be to encourage men to disinvest, to disinvest in gendered identities and to break down the gender binary, to break down kind of rigid ideas that these qualities are desirable for males and these other qualities are desirable for females. And there's a risk here of a kind of essentialism in which we imply that, you know, qualities of um, you know, non-violence or nurturance and so on should be available only to men and boys and not also to women and girls. And so I have this kind of, you know, Ambivalence, I, I think we need a kind of both and strategy where in some times and places, I think we should talk about healthy or positive masculinity very pragmatically because many, many boys 
uh, at the moment in many countries still have some sense of investment in being seen as a boy, being seen as a man. And we have to kind of manage that. I think it's premature to expect men and boys to abandon kind of gendered identities and gendered investments um, in those notions at this point. On the other hand, I think we also need to encourage uh, a kind of de-gendering strategy and we need to explicitly challenge gender binaries. And whatever we do, we certainly need to avoid any implication that the positive qualities we're seeking to nurture are, are only available to men and boys, not also available to women and girls. Mm. I mean, that makes a lot of sense to me, actually. I, I, I wanted to ask a, a rider to that, which is, you know, when, when you look at this, these issues from a sort of project program point of view and you're working on the ground and you've got men coming into your centre or whatever, you know, it's probably a lot easier to go with the sort of positive, healthy masculinity framing than to explain and and work with the notion of disinvestment, uh, is that a, is that an issue? Where you know intellectually, it's it, I, I, it totally makes sense to disinvest in the longer term, but but uh, when when faced with the reality on the ground, you may find it different. That, I think that's part of it. I think it's also possible to encourage, if you like, a kind of disinvestment or what some people call a feminist androgyny strategy a degendering or feminist androgyny strategy from the get-go. But I don't think, you know, I don't think it would be smart to do that in highly intellectualised or overtly politicised ways. I think there's very everyday ways to do that, to say, you know, who gives a, a stuff whether, you know, you're perceived as a man or a woman. It kind of doesn't matter as long as you're, you know, living a good life or behaving well. I'm not, I'm not modelling this very well, but I think there are very everyday ways to engage men and boys in kind of thinking a bit beyond gender binaries and gender categories as well mm. one thing i suppose connected to that and maybe going back to what we we're discussing earlier in terms of the kind of development of like violence prevention work with men and boys um like are there any particular developments or trends or maybe specific examples of this work which give you hope you know which give you a real cause for optimism like are there particular examples or particular trends you've seen within this field of work which which really make you feel like yeah we really are making progress here and we really are having an impact Look, I, I think i think we are starting to see in the field a, a greater sophistication a greater sophistication in the kinds of strategies that are used and a sophistication about the kind of political and theoretical frameworks that guide those strategies so for example I think there's a growing kind of richness in um, various strategies for engaging men and boys on the ground, uh, where facilitators and educators and advocates are engaging with men in really kind of deep, compassionate ways, but also in critical ways. I think we're moving beyond some of the kind of um, simplistic and kind of naively optimistic approaches that perhaps, um, you know, were more evident, um, you know, as this field first started taking off in the 80s and 90s. I think that the interventions themselves are getting more sophisticated. So, for example, they're increasing in duration. We're seeing a move away from the kind of one-off talk, the one-off lecture, to multi-session programs and programs that engage men and boys in much more interactive and participatory ways than they used to. I think another thing that I'm excited by is the growing use of community level strategies. So rather than strategies that only engage a particular group of boys in a particular setting, we're seeing strategies that, that seek to engage entire communities that work with a particular, this is particularly in the global south actually, some of the best work is happening in countries in the global south rather than in countries like mine and Australia, where we're seeing community level strategies that um, seek to engage large numbers of the community in taking ownership of questions of violence prevention and getting involved in networks and projects where men and boys are part of that engagement. And so part of the work is, you know, training up um, male uh, community leaders or religious leaders or local political leaders. Part of that work is seeking to identify uh, everyday men in the community who are already advocates, who already treat the women and girls in their lives with respect and care um, and mobilizing them as advocates and so on. So I think, um, yeah, off the top of my head, at least, I think these are some examples of a growing a kind of robustness and sophistication in the work with men and boys. Another example is uh, online, that you know, there's growing recognition that online communities, uh, on the one hand, are spaces where boys and men sometimes are radicalised into sexism, into misogyny, 
whether that's through pornography or through the you know misogynist social influences like Andrew Tate or in other toxic or men's rights advocacy, that is anti-feminist spaces on the one hand. On the other hand, there's growing re recognition that online spaces and tools also are vital measures to engage men and boys in positive change. And so we're starting to see, I think, a kind of first generation of online educational tools and online communication and social marketing strategies that seek to use the power of the internet and the reach of the internet to engage men and boys in positive change. Last strategy I'll mention, which I think is exciting, is we're starting to see a growing focus on holding our political leaders accountable. Much of the work with men and boys um, has focused on men and boys, in fact, who are relatively disadvantaged. Ordinary men and boys, ordinary citizens, um, you know, disadvantaged indigenous or ethnic minority boys and so on. And obviously all those forms of work are important, but we also need to hold the most powerful cohorts of men and boys to account. So inviting male political and economic leaders, um, or in fact pressuring those leaders to institute gender equality and violence prevention policies at a state level, at an international level, and so on. So we see some good work by you know, organisations in South Africa, organisations in other countries, starting to pay attention to the kind of structures of power, the structures of patriarchal power uh, in government, in um, national and international econ organ economic organisations and elsewhere. You mentioned a minute ago there um, the, the whole relationship between pornography and violence, uh, Michael. Um, um, this is obviously a, a pretty contested field, but I was wondering if you wanted to say a little bit more about that work because you, ha you have done some research on that as well. Um, I mean, why is it important to address pornography when thinking about issues such as sexual violence? What, what are some of the impacts it has on men and boys? Sure. Look, the, the, the simple thing I would say is that is that pornography? Is that the use of pornography is well documented as a risk factor for boys and young men's perpetration? In fact, boys and men's, not necessarily young men's, boys and men's perpetration of sexual violence. And there is a, a consistent and increasingly large body of evidence from experimental studies, from correlational studies, from longitudinal studies that track people over time, an increasing body of evidence that pornography consumption feeds into sexual violence. It's not the only thing that causes sexual violence, and it doesn't, pornography use doesn't inevitably cause sexual violence, but it makes the perpetration of sexual violence more likely. And we know that, for example, pornography shapes its users' sexual attitudes. It shapes um, the attitudes, for example, that young men have towards particular sexual practices. It shapes their interest in sexual practices. And more importantly, it shapes their behavior. It shapes young men's interest in, for example, the practice of strangulation, of strangling their sexual partners. It shapes young men's interest in anal intercourse. Now, there's no problem with anal intercourse. The problem is when, is when young men expect that their partners will, ha will have anal intercourse with them and pressure or coerce their partners into, the, into that practice. We know that pornography also shapes sexist attitudes and sexist behaviors. It shapes how boys and men see girls and women, and it shapes how girls and women see themselves. And finally, there's good evidence that pornography shapes sexually aggressive um, and violent supportive attitudes and behaviours. And in fact, there's a circular relationship between pornography and sexual aggression. Take a 16-year-old boy, for example, who already see girl, sees girls and women as sexual objects and already has some predisposition towards sexual violence. He's more likely to be attracted to pornography, particularly that shows violence, and it will have a greater impact on him than a different 16-year-old boy who has much more gender equitable and anti-violence attitudes. When that 16-year-old boy encounters pornography, and much pornography is sexist and violence supportive in its content, when that more gender equitable 16-year-old boy encounters pornography, he's more likely to reject it, less likely to be influenced by it. So there's a circular relationship between pornography and sexual aggression. But if someone says to you that we don't know if pornography shapes sexual violence or the jury is out, I would say very bluntly that they're, they're either ignorant or dishonest because there is a wealth of evidence, and I've certainly you know, written this up, mm -hmm. a wealth of evidence that pornography is one driver, one risk factor for sexual violence perpetration. Mm. I mean, I've, I've had uh, several parents talk to me recently and say, you know, how, how do I initiate a sort of meaningful conversation with uh, boys, young men, my son, 
about this whole area. I'm wondering if there's advice that you'd give to parents in this regard, um, perhaps not just about you know pornography, but also about some of the, the Andrew Tate issues as well. Absolutely. Um, look, uh, look. I've given workshops for parents on uh, young people's pornography use and what to do about it. And I've had, this, had these fascinating conversations with parents afterwards where a parent comes up and says, for example, my 15-year-old son is looking at pornography. What type, what type of pornography should he be looking at? I think that's a really interesting question. And I think if, you know, if our sons or if we are going to look at pornography, then at the very least, we should try to make sure that the pornography we're consuming doesn't show, um, doesn't show choking, doesn't show physical aggression, doesn't show verbally degrading and insulting language, you know, shows consent, shows pleasure, shows a diversity of bodies and so on. And at the moment, the attention in the community and in the industry to ethical pornography, so-called ethical pornography, is focused primarily on the conditions of production. Are the actors, the performers in pornography being paid? Is their health being protected? But I think we also need to look at the content, the content of pornography and the conditions of use of pornography as well. And because there's forms of pornography use that are coercive and so on. But in terms, of those, in terms of your question about parents, I think parents have an absolutely vital role to play in having those conversations, particularly to our sons, to, um, to our boys and young men, about questions of uh, gender roles, questions of sex, questions of sexuality and so on. And we have to tailor those to their age. So with, a, you know, with an eight-year-old boy, conversations about bodily respect and about you know, not pinching his sister if she's asking him not to, or about um, his own rights to his body and that he doesn't have to hug grandma if he doesn't want to, that's a different kind of conversation from the conversation we might have with a 15 or 16 year old son about the pornography that they inevitably will be encountering at school or among their peers or elsewhere um, and the kind of sexist messages they may be getting online and elsewhere. I think parents, as I've said, have a key role to play first by having those conversations about having everyday conversations, not one, not a one off talk, but regular conversations about issues of gender, respect, consent and so on. And second, by being good role models ourselves. You know, I think about this as a parent myself. I've got two kids and I think about how I model um, respect and care and so on in how I talk, for example, about their mother, how I treat their mother. Um, and, you know, modelling modeling equity and nonviolence ourselves is a, is a second key role that we can play. And so, you know, I think parents have a vital role to play. And what I hope that we will see, in fact, in the engaging men field is a greater invitation for men as fathers uh, to play that role in nurturing nonviolence, nurturing gender equity among our sons, daughters and other children. Yeah, this kind of connects, um, I think, Michael, to some of your earliest research on heterosexuality among men. And... Um, so I think maybe your, your PhD research was on this topic, um, for example. So, yeah, could you perhaps say a little bit about, you know, what you found there? Obviously, probably quite hard to summarise briefly. But, but, yeah, to do with how, like, men's sexual relations with women can be important ways in which men try to kind of prove our masculinity to each other and to try and bond with other men, you know, through those, those sexual relations with women, um, yeah, could you just share sure. a little bit about, about that? Sure. Look, my, my PhD was on why young men, uh, young heterosexual men, do or don't use condoms with their female partners. So it's, it was focused on young heterosexual men and safe and unsafe sex. And I won't try to summarise everything I found, but there was this dynamic that I documented that I, you know, that really stood out. And it was a dynamic among only some of the young men I interviewed. And these were in-depth interviews with young men about their sexual lives. And this was a dynamic where for some of these men, their male-male male relations, their relations with other men had a strong impact on their sexual and social relations with women. And there were four, four elements to this. One was that for some of these young men, their male friendships took priority. They talked about mates before dates, or I think the American phrase is bros before hoes. In other words, your male friends come first. And in fact, friendships with women were seen as dangerously feminizing. You can't really be friends with women. That was, that was the case for some of these men. It was particularly the case for a couple of men who were from a military university, a military university, and who lived and kind of thrived in this highly male-dominated homosocial, so male-male focus, not homosexual, but homosocial 
environment. So that was one thing, was male friendships took priority. A second dynamic among these men was that sex with women was a key path to status among men. In other words, you really got status among your male peers by, for example, scoring sex with a particularly attractive barmaid at the local pub, the local bar, or by other kind of sexual feats or sexual conquests with women. Um, third, sex with women was a means to male bonding. So some men, in fact, these two men who were good male friends, talked about bonding with each other through their sex with women and their kind of shared stories of sex with women. And a final dynamic was the telling of sexual stories, that these men would get together on a Sunday night after their weekends, and they told stories about fighting, literally about, you know, um, about fights with other men. They told stories about drinking, and they told stories about uh, another F, um, about sex with women. And those stories were, you know, kind of boastful stories about their sexual conquest. They weren't tender, gentle stories about this lovely time they had and how much they cared for this woman, which is, you know, a kind of sexual story that some men may tell. There's, these were kind of boastful stories oriented towards sexism, towards sexual objectification. And they repeated some of these stories to me. And these were, some of these stories were deeply disturbing stories about the kind of ritualized humiliation of women for men's amusement. And so the point of all this is that these dynamics were really troubling. These were dynamics between men that shape their sexual relations with women. And I'm not wanting to say that these are universal dynamics. There were other men I interviewed that spoke about women and spoke about their relations with other men in very different ways. These were lovely men. I happily would have, you know, set my sister up with some of these men. These were, you know, these were, these were kind of sweet men or just, you know, uh, other types of men. But there was a, a number of men who, who lived these kind of highly homosocial, sexist lives. And bringing this back to men's sexual violence against women, it's very well documented in scholarship that male peer support is an important influence on men's perpetration of sexual violence. In other words, men who've got friends, men who've got friends or mates, to use the Australian term, who themselves are sexually aggressive, who themselves either tolerate or perpetrate sexual violence against women, are much more likely to be sexually violent themselves. And there's two things going on here. One is about peer reinforcement. That if you, you know, hanging out with your male friends and they are reinforcing your own sexually aggressive attitudes and behaviors, that intensifies, that increases your own likelihood of using sexual violence against your female partner or against some other woman. And another dynamic here is self-selection. That is actively, men actively choosing to go into peer groups or settings that will support those behaviours. So, for example, there's been some really interesting research on fraternities, on the all-male um, residences on American university campuses. And it's well documented that men in all-male fraternities on American college campuses are more likely to perpetrate sexual violence than men in other contexts. Not all men, hashtag not all men, but there's a greater likelihood of sexual violence perpetration. And one factor shaping that is self-selection, where men gravitate to contexts that where their own attitudes and behaviours will be reinforced. And so in terms of violence prevention, one of the things we need to do is disrupt the male-male dynamics that feed into violence. We need to encourage men to hold each other to account, to call each other out, to say, hey, that's not okay. We don't treat women like that around here. Mate, that's not, you know, that's not an okay way to behave and so on. And in fact, men often overestimate other men's tolerance, other men's support for sexual violence. And so bystander intervention strategies get men to speak up, to be pro-social bystanders who will speak up when some other man makes a rape joke or makes a comment that shows that he is, you know, treating women in a, in a sexist or violent way. Yeah. I, I'm really interested to ask you about what you found in terms of men's use of um, condoms, but I, we're running rapidly out of time, so perhaps we'll have to have another episode of the podcast review down the line, or people could seek out your PhD thesis, perhaps. Um, because, Wait, yeah, we, don't, we... don't look at the thesis. Look at you know, I've written a decent <laughs> summary of that, of that piece. I've written a journal okay. article called Lust, Trust, and Latex, and that, okay. that highlights three of the four main reasons that structured men's uh, unsafe sex, men's non-use of condoms. So a journal article called called Lust, Trust and Latex. And I, I won't spoil how each of those Thank plays you. out. I know. Now I'm in suspense about finding out more. Yeah. <laughs> Great title, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yes, uh, we are rapidly running out of time. And we do always like to also 
quiz our guests a little bit on their kind of the personal side of doing this work. So, um, and of course, you, as we said at the beginning, you have been involved in kind of pro-feminist anti-violence activism in Australia for several decades now. Um, yeah, and I appreciate this is perhaps a question you might have been asked quite a lot, but could you perhaps tell us a little bit about how it was that you, you first did get involved in this work? And like, why was it that you first got involved? Like, how did that, how did that come about? Yeah, good question. And look, uh, I have been asked this question before because it's relative, it, at least it used to be relatively unusual for men to be involved in pro-feminist anti-violence activism. And it's tempting to offer some kind of essentialist narrative I've always been the kind of person who this, or I was born with these kind of orientations. I don't think that's true. And I've kind of, you know, I suppose tried to figure out how I came to the values and commitments that have been motivating for me. And I'm not really sure. I've certainly got some guesses. But but the fact is that as a teenager, at 16, 17, 18, I was running around, I wore a peace badge, and I was running around with this kind of twin narratives of wanting to be a good person, and wanting to change the world. So I had some kind of ethical and activist-oriented narrative from fairly early on. And I've got some guesses as to, you know, what in my family background or other experience might have um, nurtured that. But in any case, that kind of activist uh, narrative meant that when I, um, when I was 17, 18, when I went to university, I got involved in the anti-nuclear movement. I got involved in left-wing student politics. And feminist women were the backbone of the group in which I was involved. So I was going out with feminist women. I was being challenged on my sexism, as were other men in the group. I, for some reason, decided to do what was at the time called women's studies. Now it would be called, you know, gender studies or feminist studies. Um, and so I was being exposed to feminist scholarship and also to sort of social justice um, issues in sociology, as well as in my political activism. For some reason, at the age of 20, I joined a men's group, an anti-sexist men's group, after I saw an ad. I literally saw a, you know, a, a kind of flyer stuck on a wall and went along to a community meeting and ended up in a men's group with seven other men where we had a kind of strong pro-feminist orientation. Half of the men were gay or bisexual, and there was a kind of shared feminist politics. And we met for, I think, two years, every second Tuesday for about three hours, and it was based on critical feminist consciousness raising. So we explored violence and pornography and sexism and fathering and body image and so on. So those experiences were transformative um, and they built on those kind of earlier narratives. And really they and other experiences for me nurtured a kind of lifelong passion, a lifelong passion for um, you know, contributing to personal and social change uh, particularly on issues of gender and sexuality. And I feel incredibly fortunate to have had this kind of guiding passion for so long and now to you know, be able to pay my rent uh, by doing work related to those passions. Sounds so so similar to the journey that uh, some of our other interviewees have gone on, actually. Particularly Bob Pease talked about the same, same kind of initiatives that he was part of as well. So, um, and the role of education is, is fascinating. I mean, you know, uh, regular listeners will know that uh, Stephen and I and, and other people were involved in, in uh, writing a, a book about the sort of pathways that, that men follow to anti-violence activism. And, and in that book, you know, education and uh, uh, university studies were a key part of that. But uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to just finish by asking you something slightly related but, uh, but different, which is how, how, do you, how do you keep going? How do you maintain your sense of dedication to this work? I mean, you mentioned when we were talking just before we, we started recording the podcast that uh, you know, the potential for overwork is really quite uh, <laughs> significant. And, and of course, you know, when we're talking about issues for men, uh, overwork is, is a big problem. So uh, I wondered if you wanted to comment on that finally. Yeah, look, I, I mean, I think I keep going. I mean, I think I feel incredibly fortunate that I seem to have this kind of stable and deep sense of passion for this work. And I'll certainly continue to do this, uh, you know, for the rest of my life. And that feels incredibly fortunate. So I've never had a kind of significant kind of crisis of faith or a sense of, no, I want to do something else now. I want to move to some other area altogether. Or I no longer want to try to contribute to this work. Um, and that, you know, that feels very sustaining. But it's not a purely individual pursuit. And I, I wrote a piece about um, living a pro-feminist life for a, for a book on anti-sexism. I contributed a chapter 
on living a pro-feminist life. And one of the things I said there is that doing this work and involved in this, in this kind of pursuits has been of profound personal benefit. It's enriched my friendships with other men and with women. It's enriched my um, intimate or sexual relationships and it's enriched my sense of self. It's meant that I have contact with this kind of extraordinary communities of lovely and amazing men and women and others. And that itself is sustaining. So I, in terms of your answer of, you know, how do you sustain this? How do you keep going? I think part of it is the, is the mm-hmm. friendships and uh, networks and communities that I've been able to be part of. And part of it is more personal too, the kind of personal narratives uh, that are also sustaining a kind of sense of purpose that sustains this. But um, yeah, for me, being involved in academia, acad- that is challenging because academia um, makes increasing demands on its, on its academic staff and there's pressure to publish, to get grants, as well as to be an effective teacher and so on. I certainly struggle to juggle those things as well as various forms of advocacy, as well as being a parent and a partner and so on. Um, yeah, look, I wouldn't say I'm great at those things. Uh, you know, there's that there's that advice about stopping and smelling the flowers, about, you know, getting regular exercise, about other kinds of things. And, uh, you know, I would say I'm poor at many of those things. Um, but my sense of purpose sustains me, which is good. And, uh, yeah, I think that I will start to do more of those things, in fact, because, uh, yeah, certainly sustaining uh, oneself and sustaining, you know, our kind of collective practice, that kind of feminist self-care if you like i think is a key part of this work well thanks thanks for um coming on the podcast and talking you know um (laughs) about all the areas of you know involvement you've had i mean it's been fascinating hearing you uh summarize all of that and uh yeah thanks for so much for the the work that you've done it's been great to hear about it thank you so much for all of the work you do which is such a kind of inspiration and provides so much kind of um, guidance and information for for the rest of us so so yeah thank you and thank you again for giving your time to speak to us today my pleasure as you can tell it's a passion but i uh yes have so much to learn from the other people involved in this work and yeah feel part of a community of people doing good work fantastic thanks so much michael well sandy it's um (laughs) Don't quite know what to say now, really. I mean, that was just very impressive, really, wasn't it? I mean, Michael's vast knowledge and expertise, you know, just spending an hour listening and absorbing all of that, all of that was just very, you know, I was in awe, really. What, yeah, what did you, what did you think? Yeah, he, he, he kind of covered all bases, really, I think, in that <laughs> conversation, which is very impressive. But, um, well, I, I guess one thing that occurred to me was that his way of introducing himself was interesting, mm. you know, um, and we did this... Uh, little introduction as we always do about what our interviewees have done and you know what their interests are etc cetera, etc cetera. and mm. you know he said well <laughs> that, that all sounds great but you know um effectively don't put me on a pedestal too much and mm. you know that is obviously a key issue for men working in this field so he, he he's very aware of that but i felt that he was saying it in a very genuine way really and, and that there is mm. a real sort of humility about his mm. approach to this topic um yeah. and and that that uh, that is very important so so i, I was impressed by that but uh, mm. also the other another thing that occurred to me was that i think men who come from a sort of uh, feminist stroke pro feminist um approach to these issues are sometimes characterized erroneously i think as in some way anti men Mm. Um, and I think Michael made it very clear that that's not fair mm. and that his approach is much more nuanced than that. You know, he was he was um, openly critical about some aspects of men's uh, attitudes, their behaviour, but also um, clear about where that kind of um, approach comes from. And it's, it's you know, mm. partly as a result of living and growing up in a, a patriarchal society. Mm. Um, but also he was positive about some of the, the um, good things that, that mm. men do and their, you know, the importance of them involving themselves in this mm. work. So, so mm. I think he gets the balance um, quite right in this respect. Mm. And uh, I think that's, that's a difficult thing to do and is, is widely misunderstood. Yeah. So what did you think? Yes, no, I, I absolutely agree. I think he, he makes it very clear that actually, you know, it's in it's in our own interests as men and actually we as men gain so much from this work as he himself talked about in his own life. Um, yeah, and I, I do think he, he does a good job of finding a balance as well between like, you know, making some quite critical, quite radical, 
you know, arguments at times, but also navigating the line there in terms of like, you know, not scaring people off, whether that's men or policymakers or whoever. Like, I feel like a lot of his work is is very um, practical and and uh, you know you, applicable and like yeah, irrelevant to our everyday lives. You know, and that's that's a that's a hard line to tread as an academic, I think, isn't it? And I I think he is a very good example of how to simultaneously try to be an academic and an activist. Um, I was interested actually that point he, he made towards the end about the the benefits for him in being involved in this this work because mm. I, I was thinking back to that um uh critical stock pa- paper of 2015 which you you mentioned i think there's yeah. a point that he makes in there um that sometimes you know people say oh well this is all all to men's benefit to be involved in in this area and actually mm. there there can be losses as well for men in that they're mm. uh in effect you know going to lose some power some privilege mm. in some mm. cases yeah, and again, he gets the nuance there, right, doesn't he? Because actually, we should be prepared to lose some power, right? Like, <laughs> like we live in an unequal society where men do have more power, and that that isn't fair, and we should be prepared to lose some of that. And um, actually, also, I suppose, in terms of our motivations, actually, maybe we don't want men to be motivated primarily for selfish reasons, right? Like, we surely we should actually be motivated primarily out of a, a sense of ethics and and justice and wanting to make the world a fairer place. Um, first and foremost, even if we also will benefit from that in the end. Well, one thing I was also thinking about, I was interested in what he said about pornography, actually. Uh, I think he made very compelling arguments there. But I was interested in what he said, actually, about, um, you know, that perhaps one way of dealing with it is to encourage among young men, you know, perhaps at least trying to find, like, more ethical pornographic content uh, or, like, feminist porn and things like that. And I suppose, like... I think that's that's an interesting argument, isn't it? Because I suppose you you could argue that actually one of the big issues with with pornography is the influence of these big companies, um, you know. And I think it's a well um, rehearsed tactic, really, isn't it? That perhaps you know men, young men in particular, and boys are drawn in, you know, with and the content does get more and more extreme. So perhaps you do start off with things which aren't that harmful or or anything like that, but actually it can become kind of addictive, and you're constantly seeking more and more like intense extreme content um so i suppose yeah like is there a risk that actually that the pornography that's labeled as being more ethical or less harmful or anything like that that actually in the end that just risks legitimizing this this industry as a whole which is you know by and large pretty sexist and pretty harmful but on the other hand maybe again maybe his approach is actually the more realistic one because if pornography isn't going anywhere at least we should be trying to campaign uh, uh, for it to be at, you know for the content to at least be less damaging yeah i guess I, I wonder whether some of the material that young people are seeing or young men in particular are seeing from a very young age um uh, it, it doesn't start off necessarily being sort of light touch if you like um mm. it's often quite extreme from the start mm, yeah yeah that's um true. Yeah. you know so uh, I'm, i was interested too in his approach to parents i thought was useful I mean, he was basically saying, you know, you need to have these conversations about uh, what relationships are, are about, what's mm. what's care, what's love, you know, mm. what's respect, and and keep going with that, and and also model good practice yourselves as mm. parents. Mm. You know, I think that's uh, that's key. But I suppose a, a a rider to that is, of course, we know that there are many adults who use pornography of, of quite a disturbing kind as well. Many many men in particular mm. um and so if your dad's using porn then mm. you know <laughs> what does that say and uh, even if you don't find out um there is yeah. uh, some difficult issues in there isn't there yeah yeah but i think that's probably uh, enough for this week isn't it sandy indeed <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much, as always, everybody, for listening to this episode of Now and Men. Um, If you haven't already, do subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and share it with your friends and family and colleagues. Um, And, uh, yeah, email us at nowmen at gmail.com if you have any comments or questions. And uh, we'll be back with you with another episode soon. Thank you so much. Well done, Stephen. One day I'll remember that and and be able to say it, but I I don't don't think I can as it stands. (laughs) Could take me a few more years. That's outrageous. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, bye for now. Thank you. Bye.